Good afternoon, everyone. So let's talk about lab. How did uh, how did last week's lab go? It went pretty well. I liked it. It was a lot of fun trying to build it and try to figure it out. Yeah, it can get a little frustrating, like trying to get Microsoft Word to put stuff where you want it to put sometimes. But um, you know, it uh, it is kind of cool to be able to actually make some of the cool figures that we see in our textbooks and stuff too. Um, so we're gonna go over now that we know how to build these geometries. We're gonna go over what we do with the geometries. So I have a I'm ripping off a short. PowerPoint presentation that we're going to skim through from from another college um, just to give you some background as to as to what um, sort of calculations we can do with this and and how rigorous these calculations are in terms of um, mathematical rigor. Um, so if something that's mathematically rigorous means it doesn't make a lot of assumptions, doesn't use a lot of hand waving. Um, and so, so that's, we're basically going to talk about how we can take some of the concepts from quantum mechanics and actually get numbers out of it instead of just concepts. Um, it's not anything that we would be able to do by hand if, for anything larger than a hydrogen atom. Anything with more than a single electron, we can't do it by hand. Um, so it's, we're basically limited to only looking at computational um, computational methods. Uh, and they still have their downfalls, especially if you don't know how to use them properly. Like anything else, if you if you know how to use something properly, you also know when it's not appropriate to use that. You know, if you're if you're a carpenter, you're not going to use a table saw when you need to be using a jigsaw. Um, and so part of what this will and you can take take an entire I TA'd and did did uh, a bunch of the lectures for a graduate graduate level class in this material. Um, so you can take an entire class just on the theory and how to run some of these calculations. And so we're turning some of those, some of the basics of that into our labs um, for, for this quarter. Um, so we'll start with, the Schrodinger equation. And so remember, if you, Schrodinger's equation, everybody remembers Schrodinger's cat when we think about quantum mechanics, right? But what Schrodinger actually contributed um, to the theory of, of quantum mechanics was this idea that there is an operator called the Hamiltonian. And if you know everything about the orbitals of a system, you can use the Hamiltonian as a function to to give you the energy of that system as a function of where the electrons are and where the nuclei are. So basically, at, at the broadest level, all he was really saying was, hey, if we know what the orbitals look like, we can calculate the energy. Which seems like it makes sense in a lot of ways, right? If we know what the orbitals are, we know a lot of information about that system. And so that that group of orbitals and what those orbitals were shaped, are shaped as is what's called the wave function, is what's represented by the Greek letter psi, um, P-S-I. And so that, that wave function, and it's also called the eigenfunction sometimes, um, the wave function is basically the sum of all those orbitals. If you put all those orbitals together, made it a group, it's not a single number or a single function, really. It's a matrix of, of different orbitals all sort of mixed together at the same time. So this is a much more concrete way or in compact way of writing this. And this is what's called the time-independent Schrodinger equation, meaning we're not looking at any, any changes. We're just looking at a snapshot of the orbitals for a system. Right, and so in just some, some background math, an operator is basically just a function. An operator is just a set of calculations that can be run on, um, and you can treat it just like f of x. Um, 
And so it's, it's just a different notation. And mathematically, it doesn't really mean anything that different. Um, although I'm sure that Bruce, Bruce and Larry could give me some more information as to what the exact difference is from chemist point of view. An operator and a function are pretty similar. So that also means that we, it, it's an, another, another example of a really simple operator is pH. The P in pH is an operator that means you take the negative log of something. So it's just a basically a named function where it doesn't matter if it's F of X or what you're taking that function of, you're going to be doing the same math every time. So the Hamiltonian, that H, they call that symbol, um, for the Hamiltonian, it's actually called H hat. When you have that little symbol over the top, um, I'm, I'm sure it has a different name in linguistics. Um, but in uh, physics and chemistry, we call that H hat. So the H hat just indicates, hey, we're going to do, we're going to calculate the energy of this system. Um, and it really is made up of three different pieces. And we're not, I'm not, don't worry too much about the the math here, the main thing is that there's going to be three separate components. Remember the way that we broke up delta G into there was the enthalpy piece and then there was the entropy piece. Then we could look at how when one of those pieces got bigger, how that affected the overall number. Um, we can break up the energy of the electron system in a similar way. Um, and so when we look at the electrons, there are three major forces on all of the electrons. There's the kinetic energy of, of an electron, which is just is going to be based on what the temperature is and how fast it's moving. Um, and so that has its own operator. We would be doing you know, another set of calculations for each of the electrons um, to get the, the kinetic energy of that electron as a function of temperature. But then we also have the potential energy, um, the attractive force between the nucleus and any of the electrons, because every electron is going to be attracted to the nucleus, right? Because you've got positives and you've got negatives. So we've got an attractive force that's a potential energy between the protons and the, and the electrons. And then we also have this repulsive force between the separate electrons. Every electron is going to push away every other electron because they're all going to have the same charge. So in theory, if we can actually calculate these three terms for every electron, we actually have a way we can get the total electronic energy of the system. It's just gonna be a matter of, you find each of these pieces and you add them up at the end. And part of that is actually not too hard. The kinetic energy is, as a function of temperature, that's some tricky math, but that's doable. Um, it's going to rely on Boltzmann distribution, and um, it's going to look a lot very similar to the, the broken down form of the um, equilibrium constant, e to the negative energy over RT. Um, and the potential energy between a, the nucleus and, the, and any electron is also similarly pretty easy to calculate. It's just based on how far the electron is from the nucleus. How many other electrons are there in the way between the electron you care about and the nucleus? But if you know those two things, then you can calculate those two, the energy there. The big problem comes in, in the third piece because we can't actually calculate the force of every electron on every other electron at the same time. Right, you, so you can, if you have two electrons in a box, you can calculate, okay, these two things are gonna be pushing each other away because they have opposite charges. And based on how far away they are from each other and what the charge is, you can say the force is gonna be X. The problem is if you have more than two electrons, all of a sudden these two electrons are not going to be pushing the same way on this one as just having two electrons. They're, all three of them are going to be interacting with each other simultaneously. And humanity as a whole literally doesn't have the math to calculate that. That is an unsolved math problem. 
we don't have a way. And the same thing with you look at gravity um, is what's called the three body problem. The three body problem in physics, um, in uh, astronomy and in rocket science refers to the fact that you can't calculate the gravitational attraction between the moon, the earth and the sun all simultaneously. You basically have to ignore the, the gravity of the sun and calculate the gravitational attraction between the earth and the moon, or you ignore the moon and calculate the gravitational force between the earth and the sun. You can't do all of them at the same time. Um, and it's, I have no idea how mathematical research works. I'm going to be totally honest with you. It's totally possible that that's something that could be solved one day. Um, although there are some, there are some really interesting proofs in advanced math and mathematics that um, it turns out sometimes it's, it's easier to prove something can't be done. Um, for instance, this one was always fascinating to me. Um, I learned this from Steve Richardson. Um, so there's the, the quadratic, the quadratic equation lets you find the roots of a parabola, right? Where a parabola hits the X axis. There's a, there's a, um, cubic version of the quadratic formula that, that will let you find where all of the points where a x to the third function hits the x-axis. And then there's one, I think there's a quartic formula that gets even longer and more complicated that lets you find the, the roots of a power to x to the fourth function. But there's actually a proof that exists that says that, that there is no higher power function you actually there exists no formula like the quadratic formula for anything x to the fifth and above um so somehow somebody was able to actually prove rigorously mathematically that those functions don't exist so that's not a limit of us not having those functions they just can't be found because they don't exist so it's possible that there is no solution to three body problem or it's possible that we'll find some new form of math, some new form of calculus in the future that will allow us to write differential equations for these. All of that is a bit of a tangent just to say that we can't get really perfect numbers using this form. We know what all the pieces are, but we can't solve this green piece exactly. Um, so when we wanna know though, if we want to know what the kinetic energy of an electron is as a function of temperature, part of how that works is going to be based on, um, and actually this goes into the, the pink piece here as well, it's going to be based on what orbital the electron is in and how many protons are in the nucleus. And so when we talk about individual atoms, we have, we have these atomic orbitals, which should look familiar to everyone. These atomic orbitals um, are basically just the mathematical functions that show you where you're likely to find an electron of a certain energy level. Um, if, we, if we start getting to more complicated systems and looking at sigma bonds and pi bonds, we look at any hybridized system, we can actually, we can, say what the shape of that orbital is going to look like by mixing these different functions together. And it's basically like doing a weighted average. If you, if you took 25% you know, of an S orbital and you added in 50% of a P orbital and another 25% of a D orbital, that resulting function is going to have a specific shape. And the shape of an orbital is going to be what determines the energy of the electrons in that orbital. So by mixing together these different atomic orbitals, we can actually play with what the various energies might look like and try and find the lowest energy configuration of these orbitals. And so that process is what's called um, LCAL, linear combinations of atomic orbitals. We're just gonna take the, the functions and we're gonna have the computer mix them together and try and find the most stable way we could mix these orbitals together. So they're not even truly sp3 or sp2 anymore. We're just going to, it might start as something that's, that looks like an sp2 function, but then it's gonna might mix in a little bit of a d orbital. It might mix in a little bit of the shape of a 
of the next energy level's s orbital. They start looking different than just the classic sp2, sp3, sp orbitals. Um, and that's that's essentially what the these calculations are going to do. It's going to use what's called a variational approach. We know that things will tend to be in the most stable state possible. And so if we mix together these different orbitals, we're basically just it guess we're having the computer do a guess and check to see what's the lowest possible energy level that we can get to. It's just better than doing it by hand, we have the computer guess and check for us. Um, and so, here's a couple of ways to approach the three body problem. Um, one of, so, one of which, the, the one that I want you to think about the most is basically we can treat this like it's an average. Um, the, what they first started doing is basically saying, we're just going to ignore the fact that there's two electrons. We're going to look at the electron interacting with the proton, and we're going to look at this other electron interacting with the proton, and we're going to ignore the fact that these electrons will repel each other. Um, the, and that gives us an answer we can solve, even if it's not a particularly fun function. Um, but we can get those two energies. The problem is, is that's not doesn't reflect reality very much. If we have these electrons in the same system, we have to take into account that they're going to push each other away. And so they started using what are called Slater determinants. And a Slater determinant is just a um, is just a matrix where every element of the matrix represents every column of the matrix represents a an orbital and every row of the matrix represents an electron and so you would wind up with a bunch of functions in the matrix that have either a one or a zero in front of them depending on whether that orbital is occupied by an electron or not um, and this is what allows us to then take it and feed it into the computer. And the computer just goes through and mixes up the ones and zeros and tries to find what the lowest possible energy system is. Um, we're not going to actually do, you guys have not probably had linear algebra for the most part, so you don't need to um, be able to write a determinant um, for these matrices. Um, what this this slide kind of covers what we want to know most and this figure on the right this flow chart is is basically what we're having the computer do we're inputting 3d coordinates of the atomic nuclei that's what we practiced doing last last week right was how do we put the nuclei where they're supposed to be so we tell the program where the nuclei are and how many electrons there are. Um, and that's that initial guess for the molecular orbitals. It basically just means that you're going to put a bunch of, of numbers into this matrix of, of different um, orbitals and electrons. And then we let the computer take that matrix and those nuclei and just mix things up until it gets to the lowest possible energy. And so that's what this means that SCF conver um, converged is after we, we arrange everything and get it started, we're, it'll calculate an energy for the system. And then it'll mix up the numbers and it'll calc the, calculate the energy again. And it mixes the numbers up a little bit more and then it calculates the energy again. And it basically will go until it gets the same answer two times in a row. If it gets the same numbers two times in a row, if we think about this as a potential energy surface, we basically are, if we look at the energy for the system, and if we start up here in the energy and, and, the, and the computer calculates the energy up here to begin with, and then it mixes up the numbers and you get an, a number that's a little bit lower in energy. Well, lower energy means more stable state, right? So it basically just, and then it'll tweak the numbers again and again and again, and it'll gradually approach 
some minimum. As we get closer and closer, as you tweak the numbers more and more, it'll, it'll try and approach this lowest possible energy. And, the, and when it gets two numbers that are the same, then we can say that's referred to as that function is converged, meaning that this energy is the lowest energy for the system that our, that our calculation can find. So this is that glorified guess and check. Here is our first guess, then it takes another guess and another guess until we get the same answer twice in a row. Um, and so that's what's referred to as a self-consistent method. If it's self-consistent, that means that you're that if you do the calculation twice in a row, you get the same answer. And so that self-consistent method um, is what we're having the computer do for us. Right. And then so once the and that's SCF stands for self-consistent field. So once you get the same answer twice in a row, we can say, oh, that must be what the wave function looks like because everything converged because we got the same answer twice in a row. And if that's what the wave function looks like, you can then use that to predict properties like the frequency that it's going to absorb light at um, for certain vibrations. We can actually predict what the IR spectrum looks like for a specific molecule using this. We just need to know what the wave function is first. So we go through this first process to figure out the wave function and then use the wave function to figure out the energy of the system, the vibrations. Um, we, and we use a similar method to figure out the geometry. I believe, and so here's the, the general gist of how these, these will work. Um, and I don't really like, I like this figure, but I don't like that where we normally start is actually over here at 90 degrees from where your head sits. Um, you start by building or importing a, a geometry. So that's what we practiced last week. Once we build our geometry, we can set up a job. A job is a calculation, it mean, it means a computer job. We're going to tell a computer to run this calculation for us. Um, and we're not going to be using this. Gaussian is a is a um, commercial program that allows you to run some of these calculations. Re it's really, really user friendly and really easy to use, um, but it's also very, very expensive and uh, costs a lot of money. I believe when I was when I was in grad school, we tried to get a license to get Gaussian installed on our computers, and it was it was going to cost us. $50,000 a year for five computers. Um, and so we're not going to be using Gaussian. We're going to be using the freeware version of Gaussian, which is um, Mac Multi LT to make our, pro our structures. And then a, a program called Games with, an, with two S's. Um, and I'll show you how to run the calculations here in a second. But this is the general flow. You build your structures, you set up your calculations, you let the computer do its thing, and then you look at what you get. You examine the results and you visualize it either by opening it up in MacMole or by putting the energies into an Excel sheet and looking at the change in energies. Um, and then you take your results and potentially, and you start the process over again. You import the results that you got from your first calculation and you tweak them a bit and you try it again. Um, so it goes in this circular pattern that's kind of a microcosm of the scientific method in general. Um, and so this bottom section is what we're going to be working on today. How do we set up the jobs? How do we calculate things? All right. Any any questions so far? I know a lot of that was just kind of hand wavy. It's um, it feels giving that lecture is really weird to me because for the Seinfeld fans out there, it feels like the yada 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 episode. Like, yeah, and then some stuff happens, and then you get an energy at the other end. Um, but that's kind of how it works. We don't want it to turn into what's called a black box method, where you don't know what happens under the hood at all. All you know is that you plug something in and it gives you a number, because then you don't know when it starts to fall apart. 
then you don't know when your number is no good. So we need to have at least a little bit of an understanding of how it works. And then we're going to be, I'm going to be very careful with which systems I ask you to calculate so that I don't give you anything where it really falls apart. Um, some of these calculations are really, really um, tricky, but they get, it's easy to get a wrong number out of them. So you actually, there's a lot of bad computational chemistry that gets published in pretty high level journals um, because the people doing the calculations don't know what they're doing. Um, so we'll try to limit that. All right, let me pull up the, uh, the lab. So the, the lab has a few files um, to, go, to go with it. And one of them is a PDF um, that's going to have your actual assignment. Um, and the other two are sample input files. And these input files are basically how we're going to set up the calculation. They, all they are is they're going to give the, the program the necessary information for it to start this process and give you the wave function. Um, and so they look, they have, uh, they're called, they're dot .inp files usually, which, but they're, normally edited in a text editor. So if you open one of these up, it'll say, I don't know, your computer will almost guarantee you, it'll say, you know, I don't know what to do with this type of file. And so, but if you just tell it to open it with a text editor, um, then when you open it, you'll get something that looks like this. Um, and a lot of this, you're not gonna need to mess around with. A lot of this, I've already built these input files so that you can, you don't have to tweak anything. and Anything that's after a, this is a little bit of um, programming uh, information, is anything that's after a, an exclamation point means it's a note, means that um, the exclamation point is basically telling the, the calculation program to ignore whatever comes after this. So this first command is where say, it says, okay, SCF type. So it's going to tell it the type of calculation we're going to run. Um, this tells it the charge of the system. This tells us what type of calculation it's going to run. If we want it to find the best possible geometry, the lowest energy geometry of a system, we have it set to optimize. And what that looks like Is, so I have a bunch of the files left over from last year. If you look at the, um, your output is going to be a log file, which we're usually going to want to look at in MacMole. Um, and so depending on what version you have, it might look a little different. So if I plug this in, this is my geometry that I plugged in to the calculation. If it's running a geometry optimization, what it's really going to do is it's going to tweak where all those nuclei are until it gets the lowest possible energy. And we can actually see something that looks like the one that I drew on the board. The blue dots represent the energy of this system in what are called different steps. So basically, it's going to play around with the oxygen and carbon bonds and the bond angles until it finds a low energy system. That tells us that th that this function or this geometry must be the lowest energy state, which means it's the most likely geometry we're going to find this molecule in. Right, so that's the the bulk of what we're going to do. the The calculations that run the best, they give us the most predictable results, are usually going to be optimizations, because it's just basically saying, "Hey." Go get it. Go find that lowest energy geometry. So the geometries you started from last week, you can now put them in here to figure out how close your, your geometry was to the actual lowest energy of um, geometry of the system. Um, see, what else do you need to worry about here? Uh, this system is just telling you what kind of computer you're using. You don't need to change anything here. Um, interesting uh, computer science history. So do you guys know the difference between bits and bytes? So a bit is just a one or a zero in binary. It's either on or off. 
And if you have eight bits, that's the smallest amount of information that you would need to indicate whether you what a specific character was, if it was an A or a B or a C, et cetera. Um, or at least for numbers, if you think of an anal or a digital clock, um, and I mean digital like the old red, red with a black background um, LEDs, they had you needed to draw eight lines in order to to tell a to give a specific number. If you think about that, there was um, four lines to make the box around the top, then another three to make the box around the bottom. And then if you wanted to draw a line straight vertically in the middle, that's a third or the eighth line that you might have to draw. So that's where eight bits makes up one byte. One byte is one character of information. Eight characters of information, they called that a word. So a byte was like a letter and a word was eight letters. So this is, you can tell this program has been around forever because it still has everything. Um, you still have to tell it how much memory your computer has in words instead of bytes. So eight mega words or eight megabytes is one mega word. Um, and everybody's computer has at least that much. I bet your phone has more memory than 75 mega words. Um, I'm, so, and that should be enough to run any of the calculations we're going to run. Um, these things blow up very, very quickly, though. Their demands blow up very quickly because the calculations we're going to run actually scale based on how many electrons our system has. And if you look at, yeah, I think I have it on here somewhere. Um, the type of calculations we're going to run, which are the most basic calculations you can run, they scale as n to the fourth, where if n is the number of electrons, which means if you double the number of electrons, it takes two to the four times as long. And two to the four is two, four, eight, 16. So, so doubling the number of electrons makes it take 16 times as long. If you double it again, it's another 16 times longer. So we're going to try and limit the number of electrons that we have in our systems, because very quickly we will wind up with calculations that will take a week to run. Um, the rest of this, the other big piece here is the basis function or sorry, basis sets. Um, and a basis set is basically what are the different functions that we're going to mix together in order to make that linear combination of atomic orbitals. And for the most part, again, you're not going to need to change anything in here. This is just selling, telling it this is a fairly standard um, basis set that says um, we're going to use this number of different and these are the different shapes of orbitals that the computer's allowed to mix together. The more different functions we have in there, the better the answer will get, but the longer the calculation will take. All right. The thing that you need to know the most is that right down here, all the way at the bottom where it says data, that's where we put our geometry. If you want to run a calculation, you take one of those geometries that you that you built before, and you take your sample um, your sample input. You go up to edit, and you go to copy coordinates. Now, when you come back to your input file, you get rid of that X, and it won't let me. It won't let me edit this because I opened it in my temp file. Um, let me open a different version of it. Make sure you save it someplace where you can actually uh, edit it. So if, we, if you're opening the input sample input and it looks like this, you're just going to paste it, get rid of that X and paste it right there. There's the geometry that you made. And now this calculation is all set up to run. Now you can save this file 
and send it off to a computer and have it run the calculation. And what that looks like, that part's actually pretty simple. Getting the input set up properly is the tricky part, which is why we spent so much time on how do we build our geometries properly. Because starting the job, if you were running this on your own computer, you would you would have to run it in um, from the command prompt. You would you would just say, um, you know, run games and then give it the name of the input file, and it would and it would start the calculation. We're using a website called chemcompute.org, um, and this is I mentioned before. This is uh, run out of uh, Sonoma State has a grant where they keep a supercomputer up and running for random students to run calculations with because installing games is really a headache. Um, so if we want to use games to run a calculation, we click down there and then we're just going to go click on the skip straight to submitting a job. And we're going to ignore the guided section. You're just going to go to submit your own files. And you just have to pick the file you want. So wherever you save your input file, you go find it. And let's say I was just going to run, I'm just going to pick the one I was just tweaking, which was the ethanol opt two. And you can leave everything else alone and you just hit submit. And it starts running a calculation and it's going to give you a um, real time output. These are actually the is the calculation happening in real time. It's optimizing that function to get that lowest energy possible in real time and showing you what's happening. At the end, you'll get a log file out that you can that you can download and open in MacMul PLT. Right, so this one took a few steps to get here, if I'm remembering. So it should take about 11 steps to get there to the end. There's some really big helicopters flying over my house right now. Um, and one of the things that is interesting, so while this is running, so this is still going and it might take a while for some of these, even for something that's as small as um, ethanol. And you can actually watch it do its thing. So it's taken eight steps so far. And this one probably will take 11 steps before it gets to the end. Um, and when it does, you'll be able to click download output file. And that's going to give you a log file, something that's dot log, which, and that did not really help. Um, the dot log files, again, you can open them in a text editor, although they're going to wind up being basically just super long text with a bunch of information. It's going to echo what you actually told it to calculate. And then it's just all the steps along the way. So this is 6,000 lines long. Um, but all we generally care about is we want to know where the energies ended up and where the nuclei ended up when it minimized everything. So it's helpful a lot of times to open these log files in MacMul PLT. And then you can see the energy is actually given at the bottom um, to, of this system. So you actually wind up with an energy that it doesn't give you any units to it, though. Um, and you can find that energy as well. It's usually um, one of the last things on here is going to be The energy of the of the system, and we usually want it before it does that. Um, but you can just use the energies 
that are given when you open it in MacMo PLT down in the corner, it'll give you an energy. The problem is it gives you weird units, right? And so the, the units that you get here, let's see if this one's done. Oh, good, it finished. So if it worked properly, it'll say that your job finished and it was a success, it says, and it'll say execution of games terminated normally. Um, and all that means is that your calculation finished. And if it runs into an error, it'll say execution of games terminated abnormally or aborted, um, some other red flag word. Um, and that'll basically just mean that something went wrong along the process. You guys shouldn't run into that too much because I'm picking your systems very carefully to make it sure so that you don't um, have to fight that because it is a fight. Um, and let me tell you, fighting with computers, you never win because the computers don't even know they're in a fight. Um, but then when you, so when you download the output file, it'll just save it as a dot out, or you can save it as, um, and when you save it as a dot out, um, you can then open it up. Let me just go to my temp folder. Um, with Notepad, and you're going to get the, the same thing I was just looking at before, right? So that's how you're going to get the data, or when it's an out file, you can open it with um, MacMo PLT, which, oops, shoot. Oh, no, I hit Skype. I hate Skype. Go away. Now it's going to take me another week before I can get Skype to turn off again. Um, but now you can click it when you go to open with, you can pick more apps and then MacMo PLT should be on your list um, after having used it last week. And you get something that says at the bottom, it'll say frame whatever of whatever. And you can click and drag back and forth to see what the different steps were it took to make find it. All right, and then you can you can even play around with things like um, I have it's the sample input set up so that at the end, when it gets to the final geometry, it calculates the, the IR frequencies um, that this molecule will be likely to absorb light in. So, and the highest energy of those are the ones that we would expect to see in an IR spectrum. Um, their numbers aren't all that exact, but if you look at the highest energy one, out of this molecule, this one of the strongest peaks and the one that's further to the left on an IR spectrum, we would expect to be the OH bond, right? And so if you click on the frequency at the very bottom, the highest um, energy, you see this little arrow that's showing that's what stretching would look like that corresponds with this energy. And you can even animate it. So you can make, so like, oh, hey, that highest energy state is our uh, vibration is the oxygen hydrogen bond stretching and you can find some of the other ones too and you'll notice all the ones right around 3000 are going to be the carbon hydrogen bonds just like we would expect to see on an ir the exact numbers are a little bit off but um, it kind of it does all tie together and you can animate these ones too just if you wanted to for fun um, back at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was really bored, um, somebody took a bunch of these vibrations and they made the molecules dance to that I'm bored in the house song from TikTok. Um, however, what we care most about, now I have to get back to, the energy is this energy at the bottom corner. And so I'm going to go back to where we were before. Um, the units that we're going to get here for the energy are really weird units. And this is basically you had to, they had to pick something to call zero when it comes, because all of our energies are relative to something else, right? And so zero energy, they actually called zero um, the energy of nothing existing in this system. And so we're always going to get a negative number because matter is more stable than matter not existing. 
And so, but you're going to get really, really, really big numbers. This negative 154 number is in units called Hartree's, which is spelled H A R. Where's my eraser? H A R T R E E S. So H A R trees. Um, and so a heart tree is named after one of the guys who pioneered this method, um, which in this, the calculations we're going to be doing are, um, the shorthand for it is RHF, which stands for restricted, restricted heart tree Falk. Falk was the mathematician, heart tree was, was the physicist. Um, and when you put their work together, you get this calculation. Um, and so these, but these heart trees are absurdly large numbers. If you look at heart tree to, we're usually going to convert it either to kilojoules per mole or kilocalories per mole. But one heart tree is 627.5 kilocalories per mole. So we get really, really big energies. Um, but what that tells us is that that gives us a frame of reference where we can compare if we wanted to take this and compare it to say the energy of water and ethylene. So what you guys are actually gonna do is you guys are actually gonna calculate the energy of the addition reaction between ethene reacting with water to make ethanol. So two very simple molecules reacting together to make ethanol, which is also a simple molecule. And what you want to do is find the differences in energy in either in kilo, kilojoules per mole or kilocalories per mole, because Hartree's is not that useful of a unit. It's too large of a number. Um, and I left my, I had to clean my eraser last night and I left it out on the drying rack by the kitchen. So give me a second. I'll be right back. Uh, Sean, you're still on mute, just letting you know. Thanks, Alexander. No problem. Um, so what you guys are going to be calculating for this lab, now that we've spent an hour almost uh, leading up to it, is you're going to calculate the potential energy surface for an addition reaction. You're going to start with water and ethylene. You're going to calculate the energy of both of those separately but we can add and take those energies and add them together. Then you're gonna find the energy of ethanol. And the energy of ethanol is, is um, I just ran you through the example of that one. But you guys are going to start by building your own geometries for these. 
and then taking your geometries and copy and pasting them into those input files. And then the trickiest one is we need to find the transition state. So the transition state should be uphill in energy from both the products and the reactants. And the trickiest thing about the transition state is it's, it's the highest energy. It's the equivalent of the pass in between two um, basins. If you think about going from Tahoe Basin to Great Basin towards Carson City, you have to go through Spooner Pass to get there. And so basically what we do to find the transition state is we, we tell the geometry optimization to pick one direction and find the highest energy in that direction while still keeping all the rest of the energy as low as possible. And so what that looks like is it's usually gonna be halfway in between your, uh, your reactants and your products, which means you want it to be the bonds that are breaking, need, you need to start breaking them. So if we think about our reaction here, we had ethene, Here's our ethene. And here's our water. We're going to be breaking two bonds and making two more bonds, right? We're trying to do an addition reaction. So we're going to break a pi bond. We're going to break an oxygen hydrogen bond and we're going to make a carbon oxygen bond and a carbon hydrogen bond. Right, so this is what our reactants look like. That's close to what our products look like. So our transition state should be halfway in between where this bond is a little bit too, is a little bit longer than it normally would be. This bond is, these two are starting to get closer together. These carbons are a little bit further apart than normal. And so the transition state, building the geometry for the transition state is really tricky because you, you need it to look something like this. And then when you plug it in, you need to use the right input file which is, you're going to use the other sample that I gave you, which is the one that says sad point. A saddle point means that it's a, that it's a pass, that it's a transition state, basically, in between two other low energy systems. Um, and what, if you do that part right, when you run it as a saddle point, the rest of the input file is going to look really symbol, similar for an, for the, um, saddle points. Basically, the biggest difference is this section right up here where it says run type equals sad point. And if you do that properly, so if you start from the right spot, so this is the geometry that I started with. I started with basically with ethene, and then I built a water molecule that was kind of close to the carbon, but not too close. And I kind of dragged the hydrogen towards, towards the other carbon. You get something that looks like this. These dotted bonds are showing bonds either about to form or kind of breaking. They're, they're as you might have learned last week, the bonds on MacMol don't always actually reflect reality. So don't worry about it if it makes your bonds look kind of weird. Um, and at the end of this, so this one took 29 steps to run. And basically what's gonna happen is it's gonna wiggle it all around and try and get everything to just the right point where it, we are halfway in between the products and the reactants. And if you do that right, when you get, if you open up the frequencies again, 
all of the other frequencies are still there. Like there's still the oxygen hydrogen stretching bond, just like we saw before. But there's going to be one of them that's negative. You can't have a negative frequency because that indicates that you would have a negative energy for that vibration. So what that's actually showing you is that 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 particular um, variable is concave down in, in calculus terms. In other words, you're at a local maximum. All of these other vibrational frequencies, you're at a local minimum. They're all concave up, which means they have positive energies here. But if you have a concave down vibration, what that means is that that, that is the pass in between two energy two um, minimums. We have a local maximum in between two local minimums. All right, so if you did everything right, you'll get one negative frequency. And that negative frequency, if you animate it, should look like the bonds breaking and forming, the bond that uh, we would expect. So it shows the oxygen-hydrogen bond should be breaking, and the hydrogen is moving closer to the other carbon. And the oxygen and, that, and the first carbon are moving closer together. Right, so the fact that this vibration matches with what our transition state looks like tells us that this is the right transition state. If you didn't start in the right spot, if you, did, if you started from a geometry that either wasn't perfectly shaped or looked too much like the reactants or too much like the products, you might get a transition state that's just rotating the methyl group around because rotating a methyl group around is gonna have a transition state too, right? Because there's a low energy state when it's in the gauche state, and then there's the eclipsed state where they're in higher energy. So there are lots of potential transition states you could find. We wanna find this transition state, right? So it's gonna be another lab that's gonna be based around building some geometries, simple geometries this time, except for the transition state. And then you're going to take those input files and try and get them to run. And so you'll wind up with two energies for your optimized structure for the reactants, the energy for water, the energy for ethylene. You'll wind up with one energy for the product. And you should end up with one energy for your transition state. And overall, you should see your reactants are at one level, then the transition state's higher. And then your products are lower. So it should follow that same general shape of what we're looking for. But you're going to want to plug them into Excel to see for sure. All right. So that was an hour long lecture just to get you started. Um, give this a go. It's going to take you some practice. And when you get hung up on trying to get things submitted properly, let me know and we'll walk you through it. Um, other than that, Get after it. I'm sorry, one more thing I have to add. So you will need to change one variable in the input file beyond the um, beyond just the geometries. Um, and that is, there is a, a different style of calculation that's um, different than hartree fock called um, MO6-2x. It's, and it's actually a subset of another type of calculation called density functional theory. Um, which does some things better than um, Hartree-Fock does. And so I'm going to have you calculate these energies 
twice. You're going to do it once for hard tree fog where you don't have to change anything. And then once um, where you're going to change where it says DFT type up at the top, it'll say none for your first set because you're just going to be running it as hard tree fog. For the second one, we want to actually get some slightly better numbers. And so instead of just leaving it as none, you actually just this M062X, M06-2X. Um, and so you're just going to switch none to that number. And that's going to give you different energies um, that might be closer to what the real numbers look like. And so we're going to compare the energies from Hartree Fock versus MO62X. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we got that mentioned on the recording. Um, but for now, you start with just leaving it as none. The jobs will run faster, it'll be quick. Um, after you've gotten your potential energy surface for Hartree Fock, then you're going to switch that. You can use the same geometries that, that you ended with for Hartree Fock. And then you can copy and paste them and plug them in for your geometries here and just switch none to MO62X. Right? So now you're good to go.